right, everyone, uh, we might get started here, if that's all right. Uh, welcome to Australian Catholic University, uh, and thank you to everyone for showing up tonight. We are delighted to have you, and um, I know you all are very excited to hear what pr uh, Professor Richard Ryan has to say tonight. Um, I am not Professor Ryan, but my first name is Ryan, so uh, similarity there. Um, I do want to just take a quick moment to um, let you know about some of the work that we're doing here at Australian Catholic University um, because it ties in quite nicely to what you'll hear about in a few moments. Um, currently, one of the projects that we're running here at the Institute for Positive Psychology and Education is called I Teach, um, and this project is focused on um, helping teachers better engage their students um, and hoping that that will um, allow for increased achievement in their students. Um, so just to tell you a bit uh, briefly about it, this project is occurring in two different phases. Um, in phase one, essentially what we're trying to do is identify what are teachers doing on a day-to-day -day basis in their different lessons that engage their students. Um, and then after um, trying to understand this, what we're gonna be doing is um, using the uh, best strategies that we've identified um, and using an online platform um, as an intervention tool. We're going to be equipping these teachers with these different strategies and seeing how this does affect student outcomes both in math and physical education. So diving a bit further into this phase one, again looking at what teachers are doing. Um, it's quite simple, basically for teachers that are involved in this project, um, we're simply going to be video recording two to four lessons um, that they do. And for the students that are in those different classes, they'll simply just be filling out different, um, a brief survey and either completing a math or a PE achievement test. In phase two, it's essentially more or less of the same from phase one, um, but um, here is where the online intervention kicks in for the teachers. Um, the great thing about the intervention being online is that there is no face-to-face -face contact and teachers will have um, three school terms to complete roughly 12 hours of online modules so they can do it at their own pace um, and their own time. Um, what we hope to provide with this project is equipping teachers with simple strategies to better engage their students and we hope that they'll be able to learn things that will help um, increase their teaching quality um, as well as their job satisfaction. and um, Along with this project, if teachers are involved in the second phase, they will be um, provided with some uh, teacher professional learning um, hours, uh, about 12 um, for involvement in this project. So um, we like to think that participation in this project is easy. Um, for teachers, there's no collecting of forms and paperwork. Um, we, um, because it does occur in two phases, um, obviously, we'd love for schools to be involved in both phases, but um, there's no obligation after phase one if um, schools um, want to opt out. Um, as I mentioned before, teachers who do complete the intervention phase of this project will have NESA accreditation, and the best part is that the project is completely free, so there's no cost to the schools. Um, if you would like, that was just obviously a very brief introduction to the project, um, we are hoping to start this project at the end of this year in late term three or early term four. Um, but if you do have any questions, I'll be hanging around after the presentation to answer any questions you may have. And if you received a folder while you're walking in, that will provide you with much more detailed information um, as to what is involved in the project. Um, but now for the main event. Um, tonight, you all came here to hear from Professor Richard Ryan. Uh, Professor Ryan holds joint appointments both here at Australian Catholic University as well as the University of Rochester back in the United States. He is most well known as being the co-developer of self-determination theory, which is a theory that explores human motivation, personality development, and well-being. Professor Ryan has had an illustrious career in which he's published over 300 articles, uh, ch book chapters, and books on the topic, um, and I imagine that that number is ever-growing. Um, I did have a quick look um, at Google Scholar today. Professor Ryan's work has been cited over 200,000 times. And just to put that into perspective, uh, you could take the number of citations my work has gotten in the last two years, multiply that by 10,000, and <laughs> Professor Ryan would still have more citations than myself. <laughs> um, so with that, I would like to introduce you all to Professor Richard Ryan and his presentation, Facilitating Learning and Wellness in Schools, Research and Practice Applying Self-Determination Theory.
Well, <clears throat> first of all, I want to thank everybody who's in this auditorium tonight for coming here this evening. Uh, I know it's a small crowd, and one of the things that I've heard is that there's probably more people watching this uh, through camera than are here in the room tonight. So those of you who are here, you're the truly motivated people. <laughs> the others are home, they're relaxing on their couch someplace. You could be there too. And <laughs> so <laughs> um, so uh, before I begin, I just want to say that, uh, and, and I always want to say this, anytime I'm giving a talk and I'm talking about res research or practice or interventions that we've done in self-determination theory, it's usually not my work that I'm talking about. It's usually the work that I've done with other collaborators or other people around the world. And um, I have a lot of gratitude to the community of people in self-determination theory. We're uh, quite a community now, thousands of researchers around the world. Uh, last conference, we had people from more than 40 countries come to the self-determination theory conference. So it's gotten to be a kind of global research community. And so the things I talk about, I've had a lot of help um, and uh, so I just acknowledge a few of the people here who were involved in some of the things I speak about today. Um, I'm going to talk tonight primarily about education and classroom practice and uh, teachers and principals and their own uh, wellness. Uh, but I'm going to just begin by saying a couple things about self-determination theory more generally, which is the framework from which uh, I'm coming tonight. Uh, Self-determination theory is really a, a broad theory of human motivation and well-being, and it applies across a lot of different areas. But it's really a basic scientific framework for the study of what I would think of as human flourishing. Our basic question is, what is it that helps people thrive? What are the conditions under which that happens? And so we're all the time trying to isolate those conditions, uh, cultural, situational, uh, um, and developmental, that have an impact on, on whether people can flourish or not. Uh, our own, my own work uh, started a long, long time ago, many decades ago, with uh, Edward D.C. on the topic of intrinsic motivation, which I'm going to talk about at length tonight. Intrinsic motivation is when we do something because we find it interesting, because we find it challenging, because we find it uh, rewarding just to engage in in its own right. It's a primary mechanism through which people learn, and it's something we want to cultivate in schools and often ignore, I think, to our detriment. Uh, but our own work in intrinsic motivation was really just a jumping off point for the more general question of people's active motivation and how they can be engaged in what they're doing. And that led us to uh, really the question of how extrinsic motivation, things that are not interesting in their own right, could be internalized by people and come to be their own, something that they value themselves uh, to do. And so that's another thing I want to take up tonight, which is how we can help students uh, how we can help ourselves sometimes engage in activities that may not be fun or interesting, but have worth and value to us, uh, and how we can promote that kind of activity. So that's really the uh, second basic area of research in SDT. And as we looked at the conditions that really support intrinsic motivation and the conditions that support the internalization of extrinsic motivation, we found over and over again that those very conditions that support those high quality forms of motivation are the same ones that support people's wellness. And so we developed a, a general theory of well-being that we think to be cross-cultural and cross-developmental that has to do with the things that allow us to feel uh, both happiness and full functioning. There are many other things that we do research on, things like people's life goals and how they affect their well-being, the, the uh, factors that would lead us to have energy or vitality in life, the impact of mindfulness on motivation. Uh, we even uh, here at ACU, our main focus uh, with Stefano Di Domenico, who's uh, been working with me for the last couple years, is on the neurological underpinnings of autonomous and control motivation. But most of these things I won't be able to talk about tonight because I really want to take a practical focus on issues about education and some issues about school reform. And in the context of that, I'll probably talk a little bit about parenting and physical education and sports because they're related matters. They're all really about how we can bring about a passionate engagement of our students in various activities in life that we think to be of value to them in their development. Um, SDT's grown a lot and it's got a lot of popularization uh, in the press uh, in, in recent years. There's a number of popular books that are out there, particularly focused on education and uh, business applications of it. And I want to say that uh, I'm really glad that there are such popular books that are out there because I'm a terrible popular writer. 
all those <laughs> publications that Ryan just talked about, they, they would really help you to sleep at night if you would really <laughs> ha have trouble with that. So I'm really happy when people write uh, uh, interesting and popular books at it. But I just want to point out a couple that were here in Australia that, are, uh, that come from Australia that are directly on the topic tonight. And they were by people at the University of Queensland. This one here called Goal Setting and Motivation and Therapy, which is directed at uh, how we help children grow and change uh, in clinical spheres. And then uh, uh, Ziviani and Polson and colleagues also have another book that they just came out with that's called The Art and Science of Motivation, also about how to motivate kids. And so I just recommend both of those as kind of local books that uh, I think to have uh, merit in explicating SDT. So let me get to our topic at hand. And just before I do that, let me say that my, my plan tonight is, I don't really have a plan. Uh, my, plan, my plan tonight is to talk to you for a while about self-determination theory and its application in the classroom and then really uh, hopefully have a lot of time for questions and answers, which is the part that I would most like to get to. So uh, if you'll bear with me for a bit, I'll drone on for a bit and then I will actually ask, uh, list, uh, speak about the things that are relevant to you, I hope. Uh, so at the heart of self-determination theory from our, the very beginning has been this question, which is what is motivation? and how are people motivated to do the things that they do. And everybody here knows what this term means. You know that to be motivated means that you're moved into action. But we can be moved into action by many different things in life. We can be moved into action because uh, somebody uh, threatens us uh, with punishment or uh, with a big stick if we don't do what they say. And that can be very, very motivating, at least in a very immediate sense. We can be motivated because people uh, dangle rewards in front of us. Uh, you know, for instance, Deb might have said, you know, I'll give you uh, $10,000 if you'll give a talk here at IPPE this evening. <laughs> she didn't say that. It's a hypothetical. But it could be the reason that I'd be here this evening. Uh, so external incentives can be a motivation to us. But we can also be motivated by uh, other factors that are not external to us. We can be motivated by curiosity. We can be motivated by interest. Uh, most of the things, that I'll, as I'll point out, in the life that we learn, we learn not because anybody rewards us for doing so, but because we take interest and we're curious about them, and so we naturally learn. We can also learn or do things because we just value the outcome. We see the worth of it. And without external reward or pressure, we might do something that might be very hard and difficult to do because we know it's the right thing to do. So when we act morally, when we act socially uh, in a constructive way, these are often the motives underlying it. So motivation can be of a lot of different sorts, but at least when I was growing up in the field of motivation, the dominant theory of motivation was the one that I depict here on the board with the Skinner box, which is um, when I was taught about motivation, it was that motivation was mostly something that was catalyzed or sparked or uh, uh, brought about by external forces of reward or avoidance of punishment. And uh, to me, I think this is a very powerful theory of motivation uh, because I think under the conditions under which it's tested, if you have an organism, you have it in uh, your uh, control inside of a box and you have rewards and punishments, the ones that will beset it, you can shape its behavior in many, many directions. Another kind of motivational theory that uh, I think is uh, both a lay theory and a prominent uh, method of motivation is the one here on the bottom, which is authority. We expect people will be motivated when people of higher authority tell them what to do. And this also relates to our uh, Skinnerian association here because the notion is if you don't obey authorities you would get punished if you do you get rewarded so these these ideas about motivation that it comes about from external control either from incentivization or because of the authority that people have around you are dominant ways in which people think about how to move other people into action and I don't think they're wrong I think uh, for instance I think there's a lot of truth to the behavioristic idea of motivation as long as you can keep people in the box. The trouble with that theory is not that it's wrong, but it's, it's limited in the sense of if people don't like the way you're rewarding them or the threats that you have over their behavior that would uh, keep them in line, they, in the modern world, they have choices and they can go away from it. So if in a workplace, if I'm draconian as a manager or if I uh, use uh, methods of reinforcement that don't appeal to you, you start looking for a new job. If you're in a classroom, you may not be able to leave the classroom, but you can leave in all kinds of ways. You can get on your cell phone. 
And that's a way in which even when you're in the box, we can't keep you in the box. And you know, like I noticed this gentleman's on his computer right here. I know he's online shopping. <laughs> he looks like he's been studious and taking notes, but no, he's not. So any of us can escape the room when we want to escape the room. We can't keep people in a box. And, and, uh, and that's one of the limitations of that. So in the field of motivation, we say that the whole field has really taken what, what we often call the Copernican turn, which is in the past we used to think that people's motivation was brought about by things that were external, that beset them, but now the interest in motivation has really changed a lot, not so much to understand how we can control people from the outside, but rather why do people choose the things they do and how can we help sustain the inner motivation that often drives them into action. And this is a really completely different way of thinking about motivation, because instead of thinking about how we can reward or punish behaviors, we start thinking about how can we cultivate, how can we support, how can we sustain, how can we facilitate. It's a very different language for motivation altogether. And the interest is really the, in those volitional kinds of motivation that I spoke about, which is how can we help people become intrinsically motivated, interested in what they're doing, and if not, interested at least how can we have them come to see the value and worth in what they're doing so that they'll persist in it over time. And that's a really hard thing to do in our world of education today because when we think about the world of education it's filled with pressures, it's filled with evaluations, it's filled with a lot of uh, things that at least sound threateningly uh, uh, punishing if you don't do them and rewarding if you do. That's a lot of what, the way we think about schools and getting kids to do things that, at least in this case, don't look very intrinsically motivating. So our focus in SDT is how we can nurture the things that would bring about inner motivation and engagement in people. How can we uh, find the things that will support volitional engagement? And the theory has uh, many nuances, but it really, uh, in its most simple forms, comes down to some factors that if we think that if they're supplied to people in a work or a, an educational environment, they will thrive, they will be more engaged, and they're likely to be highly volitional. And those three factors are support for people's sense of relatedness, support for people's sense of competence, and support for people's autonomy. And these are three things that we call basic psychological needs. Our argument is that across the whole globe, in every culture, across periods of development, across domains of activity, when people have these basic psychological needs met, they are their most fully functioning. They are the most likely to be highly volitional. They're the most likely to be uh, in a quality way engaged in what they're doing. And when any of these three things is interrupted or thwarted or in some way interfered with, then we will see quality of motivation deteriorate. So we call these things basic needs, and we use the term need in a very strong sense. Uh, a need for us is something that's essential to the student or the worker or uh, the person's um, wellness, to their integrity, to their growth, and to their development. And we, of course, we use this term need a lot for physical things. With these uh, little plants that are here, we know that they have needs. They need soil and nutriment and sunlight and other things. And, how do we know those things are needs? We know that if we deprive that plant of sunlight, if we deprive it of the proper nutrients in the soil, it will deteriorate. So self-determination theories tried to look for the same kind of functional uh, ingredients out there in the world for the psychological growth, development, and integrity of people. Are there things that we must have, nutrients we must have, in order to thrive psychologically? And that's where we come to the three basic psychological needs that. Uh, I spoke of before. We think these three needs for autonomy, competence, and relatedness are built into all of us. They're natural rather than acquired. We don't learn to value these things. These things were already inherently necessary for us, even in infancy, as I think a lot of research shows. And as I said before, they're universal rather than culturally specific, and that means that it's on our shoulders to show that these three things are essential factors for thriving across classrooms everywhere in the world. And a third thing is that it doesn't matter whether you value these things or not. It doesn't matter whether you want to have relatedness to your peers or you want to feel connected with your teacher. If you don't have them, we would show that that has a cost for you in terms of your motivation, whether you value it or not. You may say, I don't care about autonomy. 
uh, in my learning or in my workplace, but if you don't have it, we would predict functionally that you will show worse performance and over time less persistence and sustained behavior. So these are things that we think of. It doesn't really matter what your conscious attitude is. If these functional ingredients in the environment are not there for you, you will not be at your best. Now, the three things that we talk about as basic needs are uh, these. There are competence, which is the most widely cited thing in all motivation theories. There's no motivation theory out there, self-efficacy theory, behavioristic theories, at least modern ones, uh, that don't argue that competence is important to motivation. If you don't think you can do something, you're unlikely to do it. So I'll spend the least time on this because it's the least controversial basic need. But we do argue that uh, you won't be well and you won't be motivated unless you have some sense of effectiveness in the context in which you're acting. A second need is the need for relatedness, and uh, this I will spend more time on tonight because uh, we find over and over again that a student or a worker is not going to show their highest quality motivation or wellness unless they can feel connected uh, with the other people in their environment and cared about and significant. They have to feel like they matter in a classroom setting or in a work setting in order to feel that kind of energy or excitement that would have them be motivated. And the third need is the one I'll speak about the most tonight, which is the need for autonomy. It's also the most often thwarted or frustrated need in most school and work environments. And for us, the term autonomy means that the things that you're doing are things that you are doing willingly or doing volitionally. I say self-endorse here because when you do something autonomously, you say, yeah, that's something I endorse doing. It's something I either see the value in or I understand the interest uh, in doing it. And that is what allows you to do it with congruence and authenticity. The opposite of autonomy is heteronomy. It's when you feel like something's pushed on you or that you're being controlled into doing something. Uh, it's when your boss makes you do something that you don't feel a sense of autonomy or your teacher makes you do, you, they put something that you have to do and you don't understand the reasons for that, you don't have the interest in it, and when that's the circumstance, you're likely to feel heteronymous. The opposite of autonomy is not independence. So this is a thing with which autonomy is often confused. So in our work we say independence is when you do something without relying on other people for help or for support, but you can be autonomously dependent. If I turn to a teacher that I have, and if I don't really understand something, and I go to her or him and I say, could you help me with this? In that case, I'm often being autonomously or willingly dependent. I want the help or the guidance from somebody else. But I could also be autonomously independent if I turn to my teacher or uh, mentor and say, you know, I want to try this one on my own. In that case, I would be autonomously independent. So, we can imagine cases where you're forced into dependence, where somebody says, no, you must follow my guidance, or you must uh, listen to the way I would go about doing this, so you're, you're heteronymously dependent. You could be heteronymously independent when somebody forces you to do it on your own, when really you would like help, and you can have the opposite configuration, too. Similarly, you can be autonomously interdependent. If I'm a collectivist person, and I really believe in interdependence, or I believe in the value of the group, uh, over and above uh, my own benefit, then in those cases I would be autonomously collectivistic or autonomously interdependent. So if I really value collectivism, it's congruent for me, then I'm willingly and volitionally engaged in collectivistic activities. But I could also be forced into collectivism. Um, Ed DC and I did a lot of work in Bulgaria back in the 80s and early 90s, and back then there were a lot of people in a collectivistic culture who were forced into the arrangements that were there. But we can find many collectivistic cultures today where people are willingly engaged in collectivistic thoughts. And so you see here how autonomy is not either Western or Eastern or collectivistic or individualistic. It depends on whether you're endorsing the things that, uh, that you have to do within your cultural uh, realm. Autonomy also doesn't mean that there's no authority around you and there's no demands that are put on you. So if I'm... Uh, uh, working for somebody else and there are some demands that go on and say these are the things we need to do this week, I could autonomously assent to doing those things if I believe in the legitimacy of the demands or the legitimacy of the leadership that's asking me to do those things. On the other hand, I could be demanded of some things, but if I don't see the things that are being demanded of me as legitimate, I don't understand the reasons behind them, or I don't see the authority as legitimate, 
I, even in obeying that, I won't be doing it autonomously. I'll be doing it in an alienated, heterotomous manner. So again, the issue is not whether there's a pressure from the outside, it's whether I concur with the pressure and assent to acting in accord with it, or I decide that I'm just being made to do something I don't value. And finally, I just want to separate autonomy from one other term it's often confused with, which is the idea of freedom. Freedom in self-determination theory is defined as the removal of all constraints. But we know if we remove constraints, we often don't get any organized behavior. If we remove all constraints in a classroom, we might have what's here on this top line. That doesn't guarantee that anybody will be acting with autonomy. Autonomy also requires that we supply a ground for people to do things that they can come to value or find interest in. Removing constraints doesn't do either of those things. So a big part of cultivating or creating autonomy in a work or a, a classroom setting is creating the circumstance under which people can find a reason to do something that is within a pretty strong structure and it's typically not freedom. And I'll go into more details around that, but I wanted to begin with just these conceptual issues because autonomy is, you know, it's a funny word. It's not a word that we use commonly in our language and I want to kind of separate it from some of the things it easily gets confused with because it's pretty important to where we're going. So now to get to motivation itself, uh, where Ed Deasy and I started our own work was on a phenomena that really, really intrigued us at the time called intrinsic motivation. And, uh, intrinsic motivation is something that was really not discovered in humans. Uh, the term was coined in primate research by Harry Harlow. He was, he was looking at his own primates and he was looking at how curious they are and how they would manipulate puzzles for hours at a time uh, with no incentive and no reward. And he talked about that as their intrinsic motivation, uh, as a, uh, a motivation that came from the inside. And he started to give them rewards for doing this curious or manipulatory behavior in the laboratory. And he found that when he did that, his primates stopped working, stopped exploring, stopped manipulating, unless they were being given rewards for doing so. So he was the first person to show the undermining effect of rewards on intrinsic motivations, how rewarding somebody for doing something can take away an interest that might already be there. But he showed it in primates. We thought this, is, this exploratory, curious nature of primates is really important to human learning and development. When we look at humans, we see we're curious animals. We look around the world, we manipulate things, even from uh, the beginning of our lives. We're reaching out to the environment, playing with mobiles, manipulating objects, putting them in our mouths. We're, not anymore, I'm not doing that, but uh, that we do that stuff because we're, we are trying to assimilate the world around us. And again, we do this without incentive and without external reward, we do it because it's our very nature to try and make more sense of the universe and comprehend things around us. So intrinsic motivation is when you do something just because it's fun and interesting to do and exploration is one of those things. Maybe the best prototype of this is children's play. When children are playing, they're very, very active. They're engaged with their environment. They're often learning things, but they're not doing it for any external incentive. They're doing it simply because it's fun itself. And just to uh, use an example of it, if, I, uh, if we take this kid who's up in the corner playing in the sandbox, he's learning about uh, spatial relations, he's learning about uh, the properties of sand, he's learning probably about the social environment around him if there are other kids there. But he doesn't need us to prompt him to do this, he's learning because he's finding it fun to do. And if we go up to him and we say to him, I'll give you five dollars to play in the sandbox, he probably will like getting the five dollars, but this may not encourage him to play in the sandbox longer. In fact, he may stop until he sees more money forthcoming. So children's play is a prototype of this, but, but it's not just children's play that we're intrinsically motivated across the lifespan. We're learning, we're playing sports, we're engaged in activities all the time because uh, we just find it interesting itself. Uh, I'm an avid newspaper reader, at least I used to be before the recent U.S. elections. And, um, and I read the newspaper a lot because I'm, I, I'm interested in the world around. It doesn't help my job. It doesn't get me paid more. Uh, but all the time when I'm doing that, I'm both having fun reading and I'm learning some things. That's why we do these things. It turns out maybe some of that stuff will be useful, useful to us later instrumentally, but we don't do it for that reason. Phenomenally, the proximal cause of that kind of learning is just interest itself. And so this is a very important 
uh, force behind learning and one that we often don't take advantage of in classrooms, despite how empirically uh, strong it is in terms of predicting outcomes. So I just gave a couple examples of that. This is a recent uh, study by Froyland and we're all when they were looking at what types of motivation are predictive of GPA. And uh, they showed uh, in uh, a very diverse population of students that the most important kind of intrinsic motivation predictive of GPA mediated here by student engagement is that students are interested and intrinsically motivated for their work. And I guess the sad thing about that is that the data also shows that intrinsic motivation is something that we lose very quickly <coughs> for students. So you can see this very exacting graph that I have up here on the board. On uh, this exacting graph, I'm picturing here <coughs> students entering school at age five, and they have a high degree of intrinsic motivation. They report a lot of interest and joy in learning itself. And we find that each year that they're in school, they report less and less and less intrinsic motivation until it levels out at a very low level, somewhere around year 10 of school in most of the countries that we've looked at. Today. There are variations as a function of uh, different countries and how they arrange their schooling. For instance, uh, you get a re-increase uh, in intrinsic motivation in Canadian schools uh, right after uh, year 11 because they start getting choice about what they're going to take again. So you see intrinsic motivation go back up. You see big dips in intrinsic motivation downward in any school, in any place where students leave home-based classrooms and go into uh, 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 classrooms that change every hour or two hours. Intrinsic motivation drops right at that period. It's not a developmental issue. There are many little nuances to this graph that I've oversimplified here, but my main point is intrinsic motivation <coughs> This very powerful evolutionary force for learning is something that we don't harness much in school. In fact, we drive it out of the school environment with a great deal of efficacy over the first 10 years. So at DC and I got interested in how can we support or facilitate intrinsic motivation if in fact uh, it's, a, it's a helpful thing in schools. And our early work, we had a very simple theory about this, which is that children, people would be intrinsically motivated for something if, first of all, they didn't have to feel anxious about whether they were included, that they had some sense of relatedness, if they could feel that the, the activity that they were engaged in is something that they could readily master, that was not over-challenging for them, that they could feel success and get positive feedback from it. But thirdly, that it has to be something that they see as something coming from their own interest or their own volition that anything that you would do that would have people feel like the motivation was coming from outside of them or pressuring them or trying to incentivize them from the outside would lead them to attribute the cause of their behavior to something external and this would undermine their intrinsic motivation. So how do, how do we know that? Well, you know, we started by doing a lot of experimental studies, lab experimental studies. We bring people into a lab, we give them something really interesting to do and then we would do, put them under one of two kinds of conditions. For instance, we might bring children into a laboratory setting and give them some uh, age-appropriate reading material to read. And in one condition, we say, you know, we're just interested in what kids get out of this reading, so, you know, read this. Later, we'll be asking some questions about it, but it's not a test. Uh, just want to see what kids get from this. And another one, we say, this is a, a grade-level reading material. We want you to read this. Later, we're going to ask you some questions about it. This is a test. We'll put, the, we'll put a grade on this. Uh, we expect you to do very well at this. So we put pressure on them, we let them know they're being evaluated, and that's something that we would think of as, uh, as an external pressure that should undermine intrinsic motivation, whereas the absence of pressure should help them maintain intrinsic motivation. And indeed, we find that you know, as soon as a child thinks that they're going to be tested on reading material, they find that material automatically less interesting. They're less likely to go on and want to read more of it after they finish the test. And that includes when they get very high grades on the test. It's not about getting the high grades. It's about the fact that they were pressured to do it from the outside. They thought they were interested in it, but now they see they were doing it because of the pressure. When the pressure's over, even having succeeded at it, they're glad to be done with it and leave it behind. They've lost their interest in something they otherwise would have been interested in. Similarly, we can bring people into a laboratory setting and give them a really interesting puzzle or a task to do a problem to solve. And we can uh, tell them, you know, uh, go about doing this as, as best you can, develop your own strategies. You can choose how to go about doing this. Or we can 
uh, tell them how to go about doing it. We can micromanage their behavior, even if we're doing it really effectively in terms of micromanagement. The very fact of micromanaging will have them become less interested in that activity. Now, the reason we know it from laboratory settings is typically after we have them doing these tests under these two conditions, either under some kind of pressure or no pressure, for instance, we have them do the activity, we make sure everybody feels like they've done well at it so they get positive feedback. And then we say we need to leave the laboratory for a few minutes. You can continue to do this activity if you'd like to, or you can do anything else. Nobody will be here, uh, but you know, do what you would like to do. And then we surreptitiously watch them to see if they would continue with this activity. When they think that they're not being rewarded, when they think they're not being evaluated, when they think they're not being surveilled, would they go back and persist with this activity? And that's our kind of gold standard for intrinsic motivation. And what we find is all these conditions that are over here on the, uh, on the uh, right hand side are things that would make them less likely to persist when they think no one's looking. Putting them under pressure, micromanaging them, assigning them goals, giving them deadlines, even very easy deadlines to meet, giving them a sense of being evaluated, even watching them really closely, like looking over their shoulder very closely that has people feel like they're being controlled in some way or another. And if you do that, then they will uh, be less likely to persist during a free choice period. On the other hand, when you let them make choices about what they're doing, how they go about it, they have that sense of freedom and empowerment and ownership, and then we're more likely to maintain interest in the task over time. Similarly, if you give people things that are very, very readily masterable, they'll be wanting to persist at it relative to if you give them things where they either have too much, too much difficulty or it's too easy, then they'll be likely to be less persistent at it. And thirdly, when you treat people warmly, when you have them feel like they belong in the laboratory setting, you acknowledge the emotions that they might have about being there, they tend to be more intrinsically motivated where if you treat them coldly or uh, with distance, then they're less intrinsically motivated. So these early experiments supported a lot of our thinking that if you have support for relatedness, confidence, and autonomy, your intrinsic motivation should be supported. Let me give you a couple of kind of cool and concrete examples of these things that work in the world. So for instance, we did experiments to show that if you give people choice, they will, be, they will have uh, more preference for the activity. Uh, there's a, a, a researcher in Portugal uh, whose name is uh, Paloma Dominguez, and she and her group are uh, dietitians. And they wanted to harness self-determination theory to look at children's food preferences. And so they did a, a really cool experiment that I, I like, and I think just illustrates the power of choice. They had kids come into a laboratory setting, and they already knew the vegetables that these kids would prefer to eat. And in one condition, they said to the children, they took their two preferred vegetables, and they said, uh, we're, here's, uh, here's your lunch today. We're going to put both of your preferred vegetables on the plate. Uh, you can eat as much or as little of these as you want. So a choice condition with both vegetables present. And another condition, they, had the ch they said, here's the two vegetables we have today. Which would you like? Children chose their vegetable. That was this condition over here. They put that vegetable on their plate. And that was that. And then in a third condition, they said, here's your vegetable for today. They took one of their two preferred vegetables and they put it on the plate. And then they looked at how much children ate. Now, we already know this was their preferred vegetable. What you can see here is just the fact of not giving children choice. They ate less of the vegetable than in either of the conditions where they had choice. And in the condition where they didn't have choice, they later rated that vegetable as less preferable. So just the very fact of having choice, empowering children to have that sense of choice, has them more invested in this food that they ate and preferring it more, whereas uh, the sense that it was imposed on them has them devaluing and preferring it less. Some of our early experiments that were maybe most controversial were shown that you can reward somebody for doing something, something we typically think of as a positive motivator, and this would actually detract from intrinsic motivation kind of as I spoke about with Harry Harlow and his primates. So um, our, our theory about that is that there are certain kinds of rewards when we use them in a, in a way to control other people's behavior that they will undermine because people will have a sense of not doing an activity autonomously, even though they like being rewarded. So if I give you a reward for doing something, I say, if you do this, I will give you this. You may like getting the reward that I give you. You might even be willing to do it for the reward, but what you have now experienced is 
I'm the one who's in charge of your behavior. I'm the one who's controlling what you do. Um, on the other hand, uh, there are ways you can give rewards that don't have that controlling mechanism, but we think whenever it has that controlling sense to it, it will undermine intrinsic motivation. Very controversial phenomena for behaviorists who often thought, well, rewards should always increase the base rate of a motivation and shouldn't uh, take it down. So we've done a lot of experiments on this, and this thing that's up on the board here, again, I'll put up a lot of data tonight and pay no attention to it if you don't want to. I have it there so I can remember what to say, but uh, and this, this is a meta-analysis that we did in uh, 1999, it's published in the Psych Bulletin, which kind of reviews all of the experiments that have been done on rewards and intrinsic motivation. And up at the top of it is when you average across all the experiments and you see that there's a weak negative effect. Rewards generally, when you give them for something that people have interest in, makes them less interested in it and less perceived. But all rewards means some of those rewards are things we would call controlling rewards and some are not. So if you go down this list a little and you split all rewards into two types, verbal rewards and tangible rewards, tangible rewards are undermining. If I say, I'll give you this uh, prize for doing something, that's going to be a tangible reward. That will undermine your motivation. But a verbal reward is when you praise somebody you say, I, you know, you did a great job at that. And you can see there that that enhances rather than detracts from motivation. Why? Because when you praise people, it tends to make them feel more confident. And self-determination theory says increased feelings of confidence will increase your intrinsic motivation. Now, that would be great if that was the whole story on praise, but praise itself is a mixed bag. And if, uh, just looking over here, I don't have a laser pointer, but if you look over here, you see underneath verbal rewards, there's two groups. One is verbal rewards given to college students, praising college students, and you see it's very enhancing of their intrinsic motivation. If you bring college students into a lab and you say, you did a great job on that, they believe you. <laughs> they think they did a great job because they're looking for that feeling of competence. But children, you bring them into a lab and you say, hi, oh, you did a great job on that. They may wonder what you're up to. <laughs> because we're so often using praise as a way of manipulating children into doing things. So actually you see no positive effect of praise on children because so often we're using praise in controlling ways. I say, Ryan, you know, I really like the way you're paying attention right now. I wish the rest of the students in the class were like you. <laughs> you like all this praise, but it's very, very controlling. We know where you in. Pardon me? Now we all hate him. <laughs> I know. Yeah, now all the students hate Ryan. Um, that's one of the drawbacks of this. But mainly it's because it has that controlling feel. It will undermine rather than support intrinsic motivation. And we can go on with this again, you know, expect rewards. If I say to you, do this and I will give you this, this will undermine in, in motivation. But an unexpected reward, you do it and then I say, uh, that was such a great job you did. You know, we're all going to go get pizza now or something like that. I guess that's not an Australian thing, but uh, in the U.S. we buy classes pizza after they do a good job. This wouldn't undermine because it would be a recognition for a job well done and it would enhance feelings of competence and not decrease motivation. So unexpected rewards tend not to undermine expected to do. My main point is that rewards are a tricky thing. We always think that they're positive, but if we use them to control other people's behavior, people have the sense of being controlled by our rewards, and it can have some negative effects that we don't always expect. So rewards run a risk. They run a risk of undermining behavior because they have run a risk of making it seem like you're the one who's doing the motivating here, and the other people are pawns to you. And this includes the issue of grades, which I want to hope to talk to a bit about today, because a lot of times people think of grades as rewards, but I, I would like to show you evidence that they don't function that way at all. Just one other reward study that I just really like, and I'm going to uh, use it because I just think it's illustrative here, which is, uh, it was a recent study that was done by uh, Warnick and Tomasello at the Max Planck Institute. And this was with toddlers, so these were 20-month-old kids. They have actually done these experiments earlier than this, 16 month old, and I think down to 12 now. But they wanted to argue that it's in, we're, we're really intrinsically motivated to help other people. They said it's natural to us to want to help other people when we see that they need it. And so in their laboratory, they had these uh, toddlers running around, and they had adults who uh, showed that they needed some help. They would drop papers on the floor, or they would have a covered door they couldn't reach and open. And they found that toddlers, seeing adults in distress would help them 90 some percent of the time, over 90 percent of the time. So the base rate is very, very high. Kids like to help. 
So then they had three conditions. They thought if it's intrinsically motivated, it should be able to be undermined by rewards. So they had three conditions. And one condition, when a kid helps an adult, let's say the adult drops papers on the floor, the kid comes over, picks them up, and they hand them to the adult. The adult says nothing. That's the neutral condition. No praise, no nothing, just accepts the papers. In the second condition, they praise them in a non-controlling way. They say, thank you for doing that. So it's not controlling, it's not a way that's trying to manipulate them, just acknowledging that they did it. A third condition, they had this uh, cool machine in the room that was uh, with the, all the kids liked to play with, and it was activated by a little ball you put in the machine, and it lit it up and did it. And so when children helped in this condition, they gave them a reward. They handed them one of these little balls, and they said, you get this for having done that. Positive tone of voice, a reward for having helped. Then they, uh, they uh, that experiment ended, then they brought these same children back into a lab sometime later and gave them other opportunities to help. Children who had nothing, who were greeted with nothing when they helped, still continued to help at 90% rate. Kids who had uh, just non-controlling praise given to them were not significantly different. They helped about 88% of the time now, so about the same rate as before. But if you had been rewarded for helping, the, the base rate now is around 54% of the time. So significantly less helping going on from the kids who were rewarded. Now why is this an important thing? Well, the reason kids like to help is they like to feel the gratification of having help. But when you reward them for having done it, you've just taken away that gratification. And now they feel like they're doing it for you rather than for the original reason. And this is true for adults as well. I don't know if some of you have seen these kinds of experiments out there, but a classic one to me is in Switzerland where people give blood. Most of us give blood because we want to help others in our communities. And in Switzerland they decided, well, let me see if I can increase the amount of blood that's given. We'll pay people $10 or 10 euros every time they come in to give blood. What they found is after that was done, people were less likely to come back and give blood again. They had felt controlled in what they're doing. Oh, I'm doing it for the money. And then you look at the money and think, well, I don't really want to do it for that. And the satisfaction of giving because you were wanting to give has been undermined by that very uh, thing itself. So there'll be a lot of other examples of this. But one of the things that's really important here is how rewards, which you think of as motivating, can actually demotivate. We have a number of schools that I've seen where, where teachers or administrators are trying to promote kids being more helpful in school, and they do it through rewards. And if there's one way you want to decrease the amount of helping and positive things that go on in school, give rewards for helpful and pro-social behavior. So in the schools where I've seen this done, they might have a program where, uh, this, there was one school in the, in the US that I uh, consulted with, and they had a program where when kids did something positive in school and teachers saw it, they took a check mark. And uh, they gave prizes out to kids who had a lot of check marks. And at the end of the month, they also had a big prize, a bike that they would give to whatever kid had the most pro-social behavior at the end of the month. And I got uh, into the consultation relationship with the school because parents called me on the phone and said, something as awful is happening at our school. My kid comes home and he says he's never going to help anybody again. <laughs> and why is that? Well, kids figured out, well, if they're going to reward us for helping, you have to be seen by a teacher in order to help. And so they figure out right away, well, the teacher's not looking. There's no reason to be helpful to anybody. And then they gained, they gained the system. They figured, well, to get the points here, you've got to have the teacher see you. So they would do things like uh, one kid would say, OK, I'll drop my book when the teacher's walking down the hall. You help me pick it up. And then they would you know, reverse that in another class. They found all kinds of ways to gain the system because one thing that's happened here is that the very intrinsically motivated idea of helping has been um, contaminated with an idea. No, it's, it's about getting rewards. And we can see why that would have an undermining effect. Um, there's lots of ways of showing the undermining effect. It's been shown in neurological studies. This is a study by uh, Ko Murayama where he had people doing an intrinsically motivating task inside of an fMRI. Uh, in one condition, he rewarded them for their beha for accurate behavior in the uh, game task that he had. In another condition, there were no rewards at all. And this is session one here where the rewards are being given. And this area of the brain that we're looking at here is the bilateral striatum. And it's an area of our brain where we're really sensitive to reward effects in our environment. And when people are getting financial rewards for their behavior in the game, there's a lot of activation going on in this bilateral striatum. 
But the thing that I would like you to note here is that this blue bar here means also that there's activation in the bilateral striatum. You can see it here in the uh, control condition session one. This means that even without external rewards, people doing this task are finding it rewarding and their brain is, uh, is activated uh, accordingly. In session two, they come back in and now no financial rewards are being given. And if this were just a behaviorist paradigm, we'd expect that the activation would go down to the baseline, which is where the blue line is. But what Murayama and colleagues found instead is that people who had been previously rewarded now show no activation or very little activation in this reward area of the brain, whereas people who were not rewarded at all are still showing significant activation. They're not undermined, but the others are. They've lost interest that was already there. And the same is true for um, the, the lateral prefrontal cortical areas where we would look at engagement. Uh, we, we get the same pattern of results. Kids who were pre or students here who were previously rewarded are now disengaged from the task when they're not receiving rewards anymore. You know, rewards backfire a lot. One of the recent studies, I just had to pop this up, that we're so interested in getting kids into STEM and science, and we wonder, like, how can we get kids more interested in science? Well, some parents have the feeling that if they reward their kids for good grades in science and math, that will get them more interested in science and math. What the data shows is it's just the opposite. Uh, this is a recent study that came out uh, by New and others, and uh, I won't go through the whole thing, but the basic data that they showed is the more parents used rewards for good grades in school, the less kids, when they got to college, wanted to take any challenging courses, and particularly STEM courses. So why does this stuff matter? Um, when we were studying intrinsic motivation, we said it was a jumping off point for how factors that, that are external and attempting to motivate people will undermine intrinsic motivation. So we thought we should look at that in a classroom kind of setting. And this was one of our very first studies at that. And this was a study of all fourth, fifth, and sixth graders in a particular school district in uh, our, our home city of Rochester. And here, we just asked teachers, how do you motivate students? Uh, if you have a student who's unmotivated, some would say I would use rewards and punishments, and we called those controlling teachers. They'd say I'd keep the kid in from recess, or I would use gold stars, etc. Other teachers said if a kid is unmotivated, I would need to find out what's wrong with that kid, because there must be something going on that's blocking up their motivation. So I need to empathize with that child. I need to find out more about what's going on on the inside and use that as the basis for an intervention. And we call those teachers autonomy supportive. Now none of these teachers when we interviewed them had seen any of the students in their classroom. So this is the data from five weeks into the school year. So if you were uh, a student in a classroom, a fifth grader in a classroom of a more controlling teacher, five weeks into the school year you were already uh, likely to be less curious about what was going on in school more likely to not want to take initiative until you were told what to do, and you wanted easier rather than more difficult problems in class. And what was really striking to me as an early investigator in this is five weeks into the school year, if you had a more controlling teacher, you thought of yourself as less good at school and you had lower self-esteem. So teachers were having an impact on students in very short order. Well, we could think this is a thing about students, but at the same time we were doing that study with uh, teachers, we were doing a study with, uh, we were doing a consultation with a Fortune 500 company about their managers. So we used the same interview that we were using with teachers. Instead of saying you have a student in your classroom who's unmotivated, we'd say you have an employee who has been unmotivated lately, what would you do with them? And we classified managers in the same way. And we found in this Fortune 500 companies, if you had a more controlling manager, you were less satisfied with your supervision, you felt less empowerment. Uh, you trusted the corporation less, your job satisfaction was lower, and if you had a controlling manager, you were dissatisfied with your current level of pay and benefits. On the other hand, if you had a more autonomy supportive manager, you were okay with your current level of pay and benefits because you were finding satisfaction in your work. So what was true for students is also true for uh, adults as well. I'm just going to use a couple other examples here. This is an example from sport where you think of sport as a place where mostly uh, people play it because they think it's fun or interesting or intrinsically motivating. This is, uh, we were looking here at uh, amateur athletes across the UK. This is a study with uh, uh, Kimberly Bartholomew. And here we just had athletes describe their coaches and, and we classified them as either autonomy supportive or controlling. And then we looked at uh, what happened with athletes, again, all, at all levels. And 
If you had an autonomy supportive coach, coach you tended to feel more relatedness, autonomy, competence while you were uh, in practice and on the field, and that led to more positive affect and less burnout, and the opposite was true of control. To the elite athletes, we did an additional thing, which is before they went to practice, we took a mouth swab, and we took a particular assay here for uh, secretory immunoglobin A. And this is, a, this is a protein that you secrete when you're under stress or you have a kind of an acute feeling of pressure. And what we're seeing here is that if you have a controlling coach, every time you walk into practice, you're, uh, you're showing this physical sign of stress. So it's no wonder we see the burnout and the dropout we do from more con controlling coaching styles. It's also true in classrooms. This was a study by uh, uh, Reeve and Sang. They showed that this is looking at teachers in a classroom kind of setting. Uh, and, uh, and what you can see here is if you have a control, they, they did an experimental study with a controlling teacher, a neutral teacher, and an autonomy supportive teacher. And cortisol levels shot up for people who had the controlling uh, teaching condition and took a, a bit to recover. Even at, uh, at the recovery point, there's still higher cortisol levels in those people who had a controlling teacher. So these things are not just subjectively aversive. We show them in all kinds of physical signs too as well that uh, when you're having control motivation from the outside, it's having an impact on your sense of stress and on your uh, behavioral motivation as well. And I'm gonna skip this part on video games and why they're so intrinsically motivating. Intrinsic motivation is a hugely important thing and yet it's so easily undermined by even positive controlling motivational things like rewards. And I want to go on with that, but first I want to go to just the other topic here of extrinsic motivation. I just want to begin by saying, you know, I'm talking about intrinsic motivation like it's really good, but that doesn't mean that extrinsic motivation is not good. Uh, that would be, in our view, a pretty false dichotomy. When we think about extrinsic motivation, we're thinking about people doing something not because it's inherently interesting or fun, but doing it because uh, they, they have an end that's separable from the activity they'd like to accomplish. So extrinsic motivation really refers to all instrumental motivation. So some extrinsic motivation is when we're doing something because we're trying to avoid getting yelled at or punishment. Sometimes we're extrinsically motivated because we're looking for the carrot or the reward. But we can also be extrinsically motivated by something like, I, I think it's worthwhile to do this even though it's not fun. Or you know, I'll exercise because I think it will be good for my health. I don't do it because it's intrinsically motivated, but rather because I think it would be worthwhile. So if we have this more complicated view of extrinsic motivation, we want to get more resolution on it. And uh, bear with me here for a minute as I, as I explain to you that our view of extrinsic motivation in SCT is a bit complicated because we think there are separate types of extrinsic motivation. One is the extrinsic motivation of when you're doing something because you're pushed around by rewards and punishments that somebody else has. We call this external regulation. And as I've already kind of suggested, external regulation is not a very uh, persistent form of motivation. If I have a big stick, I can get you to act, but to get you to sustain action over time, I've got to keep following you around with that stick because the minute I put it down, that's when you'll stop acting. It's similarly true for carrots. If I'm gonna get you to be motivated through rewards, I've gotta persistently monitor your behavior and give you rewards for doing it. So it's not that external regulation can't be effective. It requires a tremendous effort and it's not very sustainable over time. Still another kind of extrinsic motivation is what we call introjection. And this is when instead of external rewards, pushing you around its internal rewards and punishments. You feel uh, proud of yourself and self-esteem when you do well. You feel guilty or bad or uh, in some way wanting when you don't do well. And typically, interjection is a result of the fact that it, other people have really approved of you when you've done well. So the student who's very interjected is the one who thinks, my parents only love me if I succeed. Then they have high interjection or they think no one will love me if I don't succeed. This would also lead them uh, to interjection. Very powerful form of motivation, but it's also very vulnerable to being disrupted. If you have somebody who's high in interjection, but they start to face any failure or setbacks, their motivation can be very unstable and they can either take it out of themselves or they can stop being motivated for that activity. Still somewhat more uh, autonomous on a continuum of motivation is what we call identification and integration. And this is where 
you're doing something extrinsically oriented, you don't find it fun or interesting, but you do know it's worthwhile. When you have a good reason for doing something, you understand why it would be valuable, this is a form of extrinsic motivation that you can then do quite willingly, even though it's not fun. So when we think about extrinsic motivation, we think of it as a continuum that goes from uh, heteronymous all the way up to relatively autonomous, and these are more, as a more sustainable form of extrinsic motivation. Just to show you some examples of this, this is uh, Japanese elementary school children, and they're being asked why do they do their schoolwork and homework? And you can see these reasons here, external regulation, interjected, identified, and intrinsic. And if you look at value for school, the people who are externally regulated, they don't find that there's no relation of value in school. Very positive relations, the more autonomous the form of motivation. If you look at how they're going about their learning strategies, if you're externally regulated, you don't have a very deep learning strategy. The more autonomous you are, the more deep, the more superficial your learning strategy, the more you're externally uh, or controlled in your focus. Um, so this is, uh, as I say, Japanese school children. This is a study by Yamauchi and Tanaka, but it's pretty much the same pattern of findings we would find in the U.S. Uh, you see work avoidance here. The more externally regulated, the more you want to avoid work. The more autonomous you are, the more you are not avoidant of work. In classrooms, if you have more autonomy in classrooms, this is sixth graders in the U.S., uh, you're more persistent, you have more curiosity, you participate more, you have less anxiety, less boredom, less anger in the classroom. You have the right affect, so to speak, to be engaged and attentive in what's going on in classrooms. And this shows up as well in grades. Controlling for your standardized achievement test scores, controlling for prior grades, other things like that, we find that in classrooms where students are more autonomously motivated, they get better performance. Uh, relative to their own capabilities. This is a, a more recent study on, uh, and I, just from a different kind of education. This is music education. This is a study that was done by Paul Evans and uh, Bonneville Rusi. And they were looking at uh, relatively elite musicians in New Zealand and in Australia here, people who were in uh, conservatories. And they're looking at their practice patterns here. And you can see that the more autonomously motivated the music student is, the more they want hard things to practice when they're going into the practice. The more frequently they practice, the longer their practice, and the more they rate their practice as of high quality. And they're likely to have this autonomy of motivation when they experience uh, their uh, music school as supporting their basic psychological needs. So autonomous motivation produces a lot of cool things. It's a good thing. Helps us be engaged. Uh, it's associated with deeper learning associated with more vitality and energy in classrooms, and I didn't get into this, but it's also better classroom relationships. Kids who have more autonomy in school are less likely to be involved in bullying or difficulties or struggles in their classroom. So we're always trying to think of ways in uh, SDT that we can get people up at this end of a continuum of autonomy and away from this end of a continuum of autonomy in a classroom. And so how do we do that? We go back to our basic theory here, which is we say, if we want people to be really internalized and autonomous or volitional in what they're doing, we need to support their basic psychological needs. So in classrooms, where there's support for relatedness, competence, and autonomy, we will find kids being a lot more motivated. So what does that look like? Um, autonomy support is, there's a lot of elements to autonomy support. I think in our recent book uh, that we just wrote, I think we put 35 things that go into our current taxonomy, but I'm going to kind of hit the highlights for you here. If a teacher is being autonomy supportive in a classroom, a thing that she or he is doing is, first of all, taking the internal frame of reference of their student. When they're teaching something, they're thinking about uh, what are my students' perceptions of this? Uh, how can I get them to engage in this thing? What is their reaction going to be to this homework assignment? They're beginning by always considering what is the other's point of view who I'm trying to motivate. They're therefore responsive to as much as they can be to the interests and the energies that they see available in their room. They're encouraging uh, also a kind of active engagement with things and interest taking as opposed to trying to say, well, do this because it will be on the test, which would be a really controlling strategy. Whenever they can do it, they're trying to create ownership of what's going on in the classroom by having the child engage in work or the student engage in work through a sense of choice. So offering choices, offering multiple routes to an end, finding a way in which the person can find their own sense of engagement in this task 
without being micromanaged. A lot of things that we're doing in classrooms aren't interesting and aren't fun. And if you're going to do something that's not fun or not interesting, and this is not just whether you're a student, it's whether you're anybody, you want to have a reason for doing it. So if I'm going to ask somebody to do something that's onerous or difficult, I want to give them a rationale as to why that might be worthwhile. Now, I can't tell you enough of how studies of classroom motivation, this is a big deal. Uh, most of the classrooms that I've observed in uh, America, uh, teachers don't give a reason why anything that we're doing in class might be worthwhile or worth doing. And so it's not surprising that students don't feel any sense of inner value or motivation for doing it because they haven't been, good, been given a good reason. This would also be true of all of us. If your supervisor or your boss comes to you and says, do this thing and doesn't tell you why it's important, the best you can do is do it obediently. The worst you can do is feel uh, put upon, it's heteronymous, and it takes away from your sense of job satisfaction. Students are no different in this. So a big part of autonomy support is giving a rationale for things that are required or needed to be doing that's convincing to the person who might have it. Now, just as a quick example of why this makes a difference, uh, studies of, for instance, Asian classrooms and US classrooms in terms of differences within them show that at least to the ones that we were looking at when uh, this has come from Stevenson's work, in mathematics classrooms, 85% of the time, East Asian teachers tell students why the class might have a value to them, why the math problem might be relevant. They often show them how it's relevant to various things in life. And as I said before, rarely, rarely in German or uh, American classrooms do you see this taking place. Uh, rationale, very, very important. And then finally, if you're going to be autonomy supportive, you want to minimize the use of controlling rewards, controlling punishments, uh, controlling language, uh, threats. Uh, I'll show you in a few minutes the data that shows that whenever teachers say things like, uh, you know, the test is coming up, that actually is killing motivation rather than adding to motivation uh, for the majority of students. So there's a lot. Give them, like, pay attention to you when you tell them it's the exam and it's going to be the, in the exam. They do somehow show they give you more attention. Yeah, and, and especially in a classroom where they have no other reason for doing it, that's the only time you get their attention. <laughs> and, and, and what I want to say is that that then is a very narrow attention. It's attention to the things that they think might be on the test. It becomes the least quality learning and associated, yeah. So again, uh, it's, it's the lowest, let me, let me go back to this, why do, why do we uh, get controlling at all? The first thing is, it's easy. Okay, that's a way to get attention. But it doesn't take very much skill to do that. I can say, ah, it's going to be on the test, you must read this. That doesn't mean that I now have to engage in the skill of, let's make this interesting to you. Let's make this relevant to you. Let's make this something that you might have a passion for uh, wanting to learn about. In fact, what it does is it guarantees that at the end of it, they're going to take the narrowest route to the end, and they're going to have the least interest in the subject matter that we're teaching them. So it's not that it doesn't work, and I, I totally agree with you, it works. The trouble is, it works in a way that actually becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the more controlling I am in the classroom, if I use things like the threat of the test, or the threat of punishment, or the use of rewards, then what happens is my students learn that the only time they're going to be motivated is when I'm pulling one of those things out and the rest of the time they're unmotivated. And I can't tell you the number of teachers I've consulted with before who say, look, in my classroom, they only jump when I pull out the stick. And I think, yeah, I believe that. <laughs> You've trained them well to only do something when you pull out the stick. So one of the reasons that we get controlling is because it tends to work, it tends to be easy, it, then it tends to be a self-fulfilling prophecy because then the students become passive unless they're being controlled. And I can, again, give you lots of examples of that. But now, there are other reasons to be controlling. Pressures on time, pressures on outcomes. We think that that's going to get us to that outcome. Uh, so lots of reasons that come up for it. Um, but it turns out to be ineffective, even at getting the goals that we want to go to. Yeah? Is this, is this a, does it follow a distribution curve? Is, is this across the board um, showing to be true? Or is there some, there some students that are fine and disappointed? You know, some people have said, well, there are some students who won't be motivated unless they're controlled, that that's just the kind of student they are. I've never seen any evidence for this. In fact, one of the things that comes out in the evidence is it's the students who have the least autonomous motivation coming into class that are the most helped by autonomy supportive teachers and the most damaged by more controlling teachers. 
if there's anybody who's not hurt that much by a controlling teacher, it's the student who already has a great deal of autonomy and intrinsic motivation because they're a little bit resilient to the negative effects. But I've never seen evidence for what's called the match hypothesis that, oh, you have a bunch of unmotivated students, they need more control, and that will somehow be a positive effect. In fact, it just deepens the alienation that they already have. And so, in that sense, it's, 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 a, it's a main effect here. It's not a, uh, an interaction of that sort. Just another thing, um, when we're talking about the needs in the classrooms, you know, I've emphasized autonomy support here, but competence support is huge. And we often think about competence support as offering challenges or having people, uh, you know, really um, uh, at the edge of their skill set when they're learning. This is something that comes out of our theories of flow or thoughts about that, but our theory doesn't agree with this. What we argue is that people are most motivated when they can readily feel mastery in what they're doing. They don't want to feel over their heads. They want to feel most of the time they know what's going on in the classroom, they know where they're going, they know what their goals are, and they can reach them. So we think that uh, what you want to do is you want to be scaffolding educational experiences so that it's almost always relatively easy to succeed, straightforward to succeed, not hyper-challenging. Hyper-challenge, even when you succeed at a hyper-challenge, you might even like it, you might even say, oh, that was a flow state for me, but then you're exhausted and you want to go home. So we don't agree with this part of the Csikszentmihalyi theory about what makes something intrinsically motivated. We think flow states are a moment in intrinsic motivation, but you're mostly intrinsically motivated when you have mastery. So this means create classroom environments for each child to be able to feel successful. And we know when we use the kind of normative strategies that we use that most of the time we're leaving a lot of kids out of uh, this equation. When people are getting feedback, the feedback uh, to be intrinsically motivating and to be autonomy supportive needs to be what we call informational. It has to be directly about what you did well or what you didn't do well in that particular performance, not how you did relative to other people not how talented you are, not how untalented you are, not a person attribution, but what you did with those colors on that particular uh, uh, layout, that was great. That's a specific kind of feedback that has somebody feeling more competence. Saying, oh, you're a great artist, does not have that same effect. In fact, it feels controlling and evaluative and tends to undermine rather than support motivation. So we say when you're gonna praise something, you focus specifically on accomplishments or efforts uh, not on person praise because it has more effectiveness in having people feel competence. And one of the remarkable things is that grades are not informational feedback. Grades are controlling feedback. So what grades, if I put a grade on your exam, what it tells you is how you did, what it conveys to students is you did better or worse than the other students in the class. It doesn't tell you what you did well, what you didn't do well, and the evidence shows that it's largely demotivating to students, even when the grade is positive. Whereas feedback, actual feedback, specific feedback about a performance tends to be enhancing of motivation. And when you put a grade on top of detailed feedback, it undoes the value of the positive feedback. Grades themselves have a controlling effect on people and therefore, I don't think I have a slide up there on it, tend to have an undermining effect. So, Competence support and autonomy support go together. What most people want in a classroom or a work environment is they don't want it just to be set free. They want to have somebody who respects their capacity for choice, gives them options, lets them have a sense of initiative, but also helps them gives them a structure so they know how they can succeed. And I'll just give you an example of this. This was a study that was done by Martin van Stinkisch and others in Belgium, and he was looking at what classrooms produce the most autonomously motivated students. And he had teachers describe their classroom technique and that broke down into uh, uh, four groups. There was a high structure group, very structured, letting students know what to do, but very low autonomy support. There was a low structure with a little bit of uh, autonomy, so freedom, but not much direction. There was a low structure and low autonomy. This is the kind of chaotic classroom structure. And then what we think of as the optimal classroom, a high degree of structure, a lot of scaffolding, a lot of clarity about the goals and a high support for autonomy. And if you look at the autonomy of the children in classrooms here, it's the highest when there's both high structure and high autonomy. We need structure in order to know uh, what to do next effectively. And we also want to be able to feel like we're uh, 
uh, self-engaged in what we're doing. And the final thing in a classroom that is really, really important to internalize motivation is this third basic psychological need of relatedness. And it's one that we often forget is how important that is in motivation. So relatedness is when you convey respect for the individuals who are uh, in the work or classroom setting uh, where the person can feel like they matter, they're significant. There's nothing worse than a student who feels like they're peripheralized, marginalized, or ignored in the classroom. They're not going to, they're going to feel that and they will become disengaged. And on the other hand, uh, one of the items that we use that's as a single item, one of the most predictive of motivation in a workplace or a classroom is the following item, which is, my teacher likes me. Not, I like my teacher. It's, my teacher likes me. When I have a feeling that my teacher likes me, I'm much more likely to want to be engaged for him or for her in my classroom. I'm going to care more about their opinion. And my teacher likes me is not the hardest thing to produce in a child. You smile at them when they come into the classroom. You make sure that they know that it matters that they showed up. You pay attention to their very presence. You show that you value their very presence. It's very, very cost free. We say it's the cheapest motivational intervention going. That little intervention it has a very power, powerful effect on children. So these three things, autonomy, competence, and relatedness, will hugely have an impact on, uh, on motivation. And I was going to show you some data to show you that, but you're just going to have to believe me because I'm, I'm running out of time. Here's this one on, uh, by the way, parent autonomy support. It's a recent meta-analysis by uh, Vasquez and, uh, and uh, Patel and others. You see here that when parents are more autonomy supportive, the array of positive effects it has on their children, greater academic achievement, uh, more autonomous motivation in classrooms, better uh, psychological health, more competence, a whole array of things, um, even uh, better executive functioning. There's been really uh, very, I think, quite clean and good longitudinal studies recently showing that when parents are autonomy supportive, their kids develop greater auto executive functioning over time, and that shows up as greater school achievement later. So studies from age two uh, up through early childhood uh, show this uh, very powerful effect. When teachers are autonomy, this is a study, a recent study from a Journal of Adolescence in China, and TAS is Teacher Autonomy Support. This is a longitudinal study, and what uh, these investigators showed is that when t uh, students entered seventh grade, if they had an autonomy supportive teacher, they had more need satisfaction. That led to greater school engagement, and that led to better mental health outcomes here, lower anxiety and depression. But controlling teachers have students becoming disengaged, and this is part of a cycle, a downward cycle in this junior high period in Chinese children here, leading to uh, worse mental health outcomes. Uh, here's Norwegian schools, and this was a, a recent study by Yeno and uh, uh, de Seth, and what they were showing is that autonomy supportive classrooms in Norwegian schools are associated with uh, students feeling more need satisfaction in the classroom, more perceived competence at what they're doing, and this led to greater relative autonomy. That's that little thing that says RAI here. They're further up on that continuum of autonomy, and that's associated with greater uh, school performance. So yeah, Louisa. Um, so we, so Finland, uh, they consequently ranked highest in Finland? Finland? Finland. Yeah. Yeah. So the school, the, the school is constantly uh, ranked high in uh, performance? Yeah. So who's I, I do actually when you look at the uh, rankings of, of schools there's a lot of uh, varied school systems that are on that list so Finland often comes out on top so does Singapore we have stereotypes about these different things but you know having worked in Singapore for a while they, they use a lot of autonomy supportive uh, techniques in their classroom. They're, they're working all the time to help train their teachers to be more autonomy supportive in the classroom and that stuff has an impact. In Finland too, I think there's a lot of autonomy support in classrooms. And it stands in contrast uh, to some other countries, and I'm going to pick on the United States here, where we have high stakes testing which leads to a lot of controlling behaviors in classrooms. Whether teachers want to do it or not, they end up in a position of being pretty controlling because they're pressuring towards specific test outcomes. That leads to more student disengagement and sadly, I think, has an impact ultimately on the very scores they obtain, a backfiring effect. Um, so I, I do think these things have an effect on some of these outcomes and, um, uh, and, I, and I think this nations that do better on that have higher autonomy support. I'll show you a little bit of evidence just coming out of this next study. 
Uh, we did a recent study, this is led by Chris Nemec at the University of Rochester, and rather than do a kind of a questionnaire study about classrooms, he had students all over the world in 23 different countries write an essay about the most motivating teacher that they ever had. He had them write another essay about the most demotivating teacher they ever had, and they wrote a third essay about the latest teacher they had who was not one of the other two. And they were very brief essays, five minutes apiece. They wrote them in counterbalanced orders. They were written in their native languages. They were coded by uh, coders in their native language uh, for a whole variety of variables, including things like uh, how focused was the teacher on grades, how rigorous was the classroom, uh, how autonomy supportive, how competence supportive, how relatedness supportive. What was amazing is how similar the essays were from um, around the world. What was found in all 23 countries is that uh, a differentiation between motivating and demotivating teachers with autonomy and relatedness in particular. Support for autonomy and relatedness being the biggest factors predicting uh, the most motivating teachers they had and differentiating them from latest or um, uh, demotivating. Interestingly, in no sample did a focus on grades, a focus on rewards, a focus on control, a focus on any of those things come out in student essays as associated with more motivating teachers. Th yet these are all the things that are in a discourse of our public policy. We're always talking about rigor, we're always talking about uh, greater grading, uh, putting more content into classrooms. We're selling content all the time. But what students are saying, it's the process. It's a process in which I felt respected in which I felt some ownership and some volition, and I felt connected, that was the place that I got excited to learn. And uh, interestingly, when, we've added, when we, uh, we're doing this as a multi-level model, when you look at the countries with higher PISA scores, uh, one of the things we see here is that the typical teacher as, uh, well, so we did, uh, the, I said latest, but we had them rate a typical teacher here. That, that, that typical teacher was closer to the motivating teacher and further away from the demotivating teacher on these ideas of autonomy, competence, and relatedness. So just a thing on grading, I wanted to say this before, which is we think of grades as a kind of reward or a kind of control or a kind of motivational system. And we think about it without any thought at all because there's never been any evidence any evidence that I've seen that grades play a positive motivational function in school. Now we think, of course, oh, a grade is like money, right? If, I, if you do really well, I give you a bunch. I give you the A, and if you do really poorly, I give you less. And if it, were, if it worked like that, then we would expect that kids who get poor grades would now be more motivated to go out and get more. But that's not what happens to them. They actually are more demotivated. They've gotten negative competence feedback. It's taken away from their sense of agency and motivation, and they're less likely to be engaged. And we don't see that kids who get good grades are necessarily more motivated to learn. They may be more motivated to get another A if they can get another A, but they're going to oh, retreat from any place where that might not be the function. So grades largely don't have a positive motivational effect. Now, this was done in a PE classroom, so it's not a typical classroom thing, uh, but. Uh, I, I just like the study, it's a Kriegsman et al. Uh, recent study that they just came out with. And you see here that uh, when they had a PE class where grading was accomplishing class, that led to uh, grading was a negative effect on uh, autonomy, competence, and relatedness, need satisfactions, and it led to decreased intrinsic motivation and increased uh, uh, external uh, low quality forms of motivation. And of course, on the opposite side of it, grading predicted more need frustration, frustration of autonomy, competence, relatedness. And you see here that that ends up as uh, uh, taking away from intrinsic motivation and adding to the sense that you're being pushed around or externally regulated. Yeah. We, we take some kinds of things in, for granted as motivators in classrooms, uh, like grades, and yet we don't really think, what is the functional significance of a grade to a student? And oftentimes, it's not a positive motivational function as we think. The thing that is positive is the really direct feedback that we give students about their competencies. It's a sense of interest that we can give them. It's those kinds of things that are very concrete that will uh, add to their learning. Grades are largely gatekeeping functions. And I'm not saying we should never have gatekeeping functions. I'm not against uh, grading for certain kinds of things. But we confuse a lot the gatekeeping function of grading with the motivation function of grading. It's not a motivational device. It's largely a demotivational uh, device to be sorting students all the time on these normative 
uh, things. And worse yet, for, if it's not grades, think about fear or threats. It's going to be on the test. The test is coming up. This was what they, Putin and uh, Remedios were looking at, what they called uh, fear appeals. Uh, and they all had to do with this thing of the test is coming. The test is coming. By reminding students that the test is coming, that led students to be less self-determined in their motivation. And it actually led to decreased scores on their math tests rather than increased scores. We think we're motivating them through the threat, but it's actually demotivating them. So. Now, we, and I just want to summarize this. Uh, when we think about the classroom environment, we're thinking about nurturing the internal motivation that students would otherwise already have, rather than trying to create a motivation from the outside with carrots and sticks. And when we do that, uh, we think that the students have a higher quality motivation. But they can't have that unless their teachers also have high quality motivation. So one of the things that we've been researching a lot in SDT is what's going on with teachers. And um, I have some pictures up here that uh, have to do with teachers. And here's my favorite one uh, over here. This is a uh, Korean picture with an automated teacher. Uh, it has all the content in there, so we don't really need an actual teacher in the room because all the right answers are in there. So one of the things that uh, research has shown, this is a study by Roth and others, but there's, there's other studies out there, which is when teachers are more autonomously motivated for their teaching. They tend to be more, uh, they tend to promote more autonomous motivation in their students. They are more autonomy supportive of their students and they're more competence supportive of their students. And, uh, and you can see this here in this uh, graph, which is that when uh, teachers have autonomous motivation for their own teaching, they tend to have students in their classroom who are more autonomous. But why aren't teachers always autonomous? Well, there's two reasons. They have what we call pressures from above and pressures from below. Pressures from below are they have students who are unmotivated in their classrooms, coming there obviously from some other classroom. Uh, and they have pressures from above, standardized tests, uh, pressures from principals, controlling administrators, trying to say, these are the goals you must reach in your classroom. And teachers have these dual pressures, and both of those have a negative impact on their self-determination for work, which then shows up in their being less autonomy supportive in classrooms. This was a recent study by uh, Coley et al. of Canadian teachers. It was a relatively large sample of teachers. And they're asking them about their principal. How autonomy supportive is your principal of you in the school? And what you can see in uh, Coley et al.'s research is that uh, principals are more autonomy supportive. That spawns teachers feeling more autonomy, competence, and relatedness on their job which ends up to translate into more autonomous forms of motivation, less external regulation, and greater job satisfaction and organizational commitment. And this was a study that uh, actually is not under review anymore. Alex, I think I saw you in the room. This is with Alex Jung. And when did this come out, Alex? What? 2015. So this is a dated slide here. But we did this study in uh, Chinese public schools and looking again at uh, teachers' perceptions of the autonomy support of their uh, supervisors and principals. And you can see here that perceived autonomy support, again, predicting teachers being more autonomously motivated for their job and having higher job satisfaction and work stress and uh, fewer symptoms. So I, I could go on with this, uh, teachers and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, in-service training. But what I want to say is teachers need the autonomy support of their principals, but then principals also have a need. <coughs> principals are being pushed around and shoved around and controlled by people above them, often government policies, often uh, boards, often their own supervisors. And principals are really in distress in, in this particular country. And this, is a, this comes from uh, the Australian Principal Occupational Health, Safety, and Wellbeing Survey that uh, is, has uh, uh, partly ACU sponsorship, uh, Phil Riley being uh, an author on this. And what, what we see here is that principals in this country are really in pretty dire straits. They're feeling a lot of job stress. The average principal in this country works about 60 hours a week. The average principal in this country thinks that they're getting way, way too many demands. And they're showing a lot of ill health effects. They have higher scores for burnout, stress, sleep problems, depressive symptoms, somatic and cognitive stress. So what, what about principals? Well, do they have autonomy supportive superintendents and boards? When they do, 
they're more likely to be committed to stay on their job. This is a graph that comes, so this is an American study, but it's Chang et al. And they looked at principals across the US and they asked them about autonomy, support, and control that they were experiencing and then uh, their uh, affective commitment to their jobs. And what you can see here is that whether you're a new principal or you've been in the district for a long time, there's a strong main effect, which is your affective commitment to being a principal is a largely a function of whether you're feeling that supportive autonomy from your own superintendents. And in their study, when they were looking at predictors of that affective commitment and job satisfaction, you can see here that most of the demographic things, uh, the type of school you're in, the type of district you're in, the number of years you've been in aren't strongly predictive of that, but perceived autonomy support from your superintendent, very predictive of whether you're satisfied in your job as a principal. We're, not, we're having trouble in Australia and America retaining principals because it's a terrible job given the number of pressures that are on people. And of course, it's no wonder that principals then are often pressuring and controlling with their own teachers and then it's no wondering that the teachers are controlling and pressuring to their own students. We see this as a rolling downhill issue and this has to do with public policy. I could talk a bunch about public policy and why and where it goes wrong, but I'm not going to. I'm going to spare you on that so we can get to some questions and answers. But I will say this, which is uh, when we're coming from an SDT perspective, we're really thinking about the classroom environment as a place not for shoving learning down students' throats, not for a factory of outcomes or where we know what's uh, the best thing all students should learn, but rather a place where we ought to be nurturing the very inner motivations that drive us to learn, to integrate, to want to assimilate, to want to take things in. And that means providing conditions that support that sense of inclusion and relatedness, that support that feeling that I can master what's being put in front of me. And thirdly, that I understand why the stuff that I'm doing might matter and also where it's possible to be interested in it. That means supporting autonomy, competence, and relatedness. And that's what we're trying to do in classrooms. And I thank you for listening to that. So I know I've uh, talked for a while, but I would love to have just uh, a few questions and answers before we uh, stop, if there are any that are out there. Yeah. Uh, sure, I speak for everyone saying it's a wonderful body of work. What don't we know, and that would be useful to know? Yeah. So the question was, what don't we know that would be useful to know? And I would say there's a ton of things that we don't know. Um, you know, as I said before, we've been, we've been doing a lot of studies on what classroom practice really looks like. So I gave you a, a few behaviors that are there. Uh, but then those have been translated into intervention studies. And there's been two or three randomized control trials of training more autonomy supportive techniques uh, uh, for teachers in classroom environments that have been very successful uh, randomized control trials, but there hasn't been enough of them. And they haven't been across enough age groups and subject matters and people to know what the nuances are there. So to me, intervention work, we need more intervention work going on so we can really figure out exactly um, how to best do that. Um, another thing that uh, we see a lot is really increased performance with more curiosity, but we don't know always the brain mechanisms that are underlying that. That's something that we're trying to do here at ACU is look more closely at what the neurological underpinnings are that make performance better when you're in the right motivational conditions. What are, what are the, why is that taking place in the way that it does? What's that openness about? Um, so I think that's another place. I think just the third place that I go to is about policy and how it is that policy at the global level uh, ends up translating downhill into the negative or positive practices that we see. Um, you know, for me here in Australia, that's a big interest of mine is how public policy is translating into pressures on superintendents, which is translating into pressures on principals, which is translating into bad classroom practice. I think this is really the area that we need to understand the most because we have to reverse that cycle. Um, so that's, those are some things. I don't know, but you could probably tell me what you think we need to, to know <laughs> more of. So, other uh, questions or thoughts? Yeah. Um, very interesting. Very um, my question, I guess, is that uh, the focus here has been on how to like, motivate students and how uh, I get them to be better engaged and so on. Has the inverse actually been considered where if, they, if students are formed in certain behavior, have, has a study been um, done where they've been given a reward, like an exclusive reward, and it's been taken away to try and actually demotivate that? 
behavior. Uh, yeah, you, see, you mean so you, um, I, I forget the technical name for this, but this is where you start to lose rewards uh, when you don't behave according. I haven't seen that in the classroom setting, but I've seen it around weight loss. So it was a common technique for a brief time in weight loss where you would uh, you turn over some money and then as you lost weight, you would either get that money back or you would fail to get it back. So uh, you would actually, in a way, be punished over time if you did. And it actually was very, very ineffective as a weight loss strategy. Um, it led to uh, big relapse rates when the program was over um, and it was less effective even during programs. So I haven't seen it done in classroom kind of settings. I, I, you know, I, I suspect it's going to feel very controlling uh, and therefore it's going to have a lot of these negative effects that uh, we've seen more directly with uh, contingent rewards. So, yeah, Herb. There's a lot of talk about needing to reward good teaching. So reward uh, seems to have a real negative connotation from your theoretical perspective. How would you respond to uh, that sort of notion? I guess if it's rewarding in an informational sense, that, uh, that might work, but that's probably not what's meant. Yeah, no, that's not what's meant. And I think what's gonna ha what, would ha what has happened, whenever policymakers have said, oh, we're going to reward teachers for good teaching, what they mean is we're going to reward teachers for increased test scores. And when they do that, what they do is they drive the worst kind of classroom practice, because what it does is it drives behavior to go toward any route to the end. We call this an outcome-focused reward. So whenever you put high stakes behind any single outcome, what people do is they'll do what they need to do to get to that outcome, even if it's the wrong way to get there. And uh, so where we've had any of that going on uh, in, uh, in education environments, we see the following things. And we, we both predicted and we found these things in literature reviews. Uh, we predicted, for instance, when that kind of policy got started in the US, that the first thing that would happen is teaching to the test. Because if I'm going to get rewarded for test outcomes, I'm not going to teach anything other than what I think is going to be on the test, so I narrow the curriculum. That also then means that my class is probably going to be less interesting and less engaging and paradoxically might have a negative effect on the actual learning that goes on in there, but the natural response to the reward structure is narrow what you're doing. Um, it also encourages a lot of behaviors that we really don't want to reinforce, like cheating, like telling your, your students the answers to the things that you think will be on the test, like trying to get kids out of your school who are going to bring down your test scores, or all the population manipulation that we see going on between schools, not just in the United States but here as well. It drives all of these behaviors once we kind of put a high stakes reward behind a single outcome like that. So there are ways in which we can make the teaching profession more professional and the rewards within it themselves more professional. That is that you offer more opportunities, you offer more training things, you offer more uh, uh, um, growth related opportunities for teachers who are so engaged. There's, there's lots of uh, I would call uh, profession relevant rewards that will not undermine and will not drive that bad practice. So the ones that I'm really afraid of are where we say we're going to reward good teaching and then we have the operational definition of good teaching being uh, bad behavior. <laughs> Instead, if we were going to do that, then I certainly would want it done on a professional basis of people who over time have shown themselves to be good teachers over time to get the recognition they deserve from that. So, and that's different. That's not a controlling reward. That's a recognition for jobs well done. And I think we need more of that in the education profession rather than less, but not contingent rewards based on test outcomes. Yeah. Um, on one side, uh, it seems very promising because uh, no matter where I look at, I see potential for improvement, intervention at the teacher level, at yeah. the school level. But at the same time, there is on the other side a little bit of discouraging uh, to make a specific intervention because if I I work hard on an intervention on teacher, then there is the principal side that, that can actually push up. So yeah. Yeah. how can we look at the good <laughs> ground? Well, I mean, your first point is a, is a really big one, which is we, we're working, when we're dealing with schools, we're dealing with a system. 
And when the system's corrupt at one level, that tends to have corruptive influences on other levels. So I don't think we can get around that. But that doesn't also mean that at whatever individual level we're operating at, we can't do the best we can do for the people who are under us. And in SDT, we call this the uh, umbrella idea, which is that, you know, the, it may be raining on me. It might be my principal's a really controlling principal who's all focused on test scores, and it could be the superintendent is too, but I'm in my classroom. I want to put an umbrella up over my kids. I want to create a circumstance there where they have a nurturing environment, even when the pressures are on me. And one of the interesting things about it is it's likely if I create that kind of environment, I'm also going to have good test outcomes. It requires that faith that if I create the right environment in my classroom, people will be more engaged, they will learn more, and outcomes will be good. But what happens is in the atmosphere of fear, control, and pressure, I don't hold up the umbrella, I, I, I will teach to the test, and then I have the disengaged students, I have the more behavior problems in my classroom, I don't get those outcomes, and I haven't protected my children. We say hold the umbrella up, it's always raining out there, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a principal, whether you're a superintendent, it's your job to put up the umbrella against the forces that are on you. And if you're a politician, God knows what we can do to hold up an umbrella over you. But um, you know, that's what it has to be that we take charge of what's underneath us wherever we can do it. So I still think interventions work. Uh, when uh, we do interventions that are in a school within a district that might have a really controlling superintendent, that school improves. So it's not like you can't have movement within there, but I also wouldn't disagree with you that there's a whole system going on here. And that's what I wanted to show is that it's an irradiating effect that comes from up high all the way down into best practice in classrooms. And uh, we need to pay attention to that. It is a big policy issue. Yeah. Oh, my, my question connects a bit to what you just said, and that is, um, it seems to me that we need an education revolution. And uh, how do we do that? Well, you know, if I were going to create a revolution in education, I'm not going to because I'm too old. Um, <laughs> but if I were going to do that, the thing is, is that there is a movement that says we, we need to have accountability. We do need to have responsibility. We do want to guarantee that there's high quality going on in our schools. How can we do that without all this pressure that's had this negative effects as it does? And the first thing I want to say is teachers need to become more professional themselves. They need their own professional organizations that also are in some ways running quality control over themselves. So we have this in other professions. Uh, you know, I'm a psychotherapist. I don't have people coming around giving high-stake tests to my clients and having a test score be the thing that predicts whether I'm good or not. But I do have boards that oversee the ethics. We do have an evidence-based practice idea that, uh, uh, you know, that, that uh, is in some ways very strongly supported by our professional organizations. The same is true in other professions like medicine. Uh, we need the same kind of self uh, policing that goes on in other professions to go on within education because what's going on now is people who are not educators are doing that to us and they're doing it through methods that turn out to be really backfiring within our classrooms and within our practice. If we're truly educators we can develop the art of teaching in a much fuller way and we can disseminate that art and when we do so we will have good outcomes and we should be able to show with evidence what those things are. You know SDT is an evidence-based theory because we're always trying to bring in empirical evidence to support these claims, but we can do that about what best practice is in classroom. And I think when we do that, we'll see that teachers could find support for the things that they know to be the right things to be done in classrooms. And they can find evidence against these uh, really bad policy structures uh, that are driving bad outcomes in schools. Hmm? So, um, it's not that easy. I said, I'm not saying it's easy. Revol you said revolution. That's not easy. That's not easy. But, if that were to take place, that's one of the necessary ingredients which would have to happen, which is teachers would have to be treated more professionally, but that means that they also then have to form that kind of professional, uh, strong view of what they're doing and then hold themselves in that way uh, accountable. I would like to see more movement in that respect. Yeah. Is, uh, what, uh, is there any relationship between SES and these factors for um, you know, positive motivation, as you were saying? Do we get do we get uh, more, uh, a bigger influence in low SES communities than high SES communities? Um, between SES, it means socioeconomic status. Um, 
Well, you know, it, it's, it's a kind of interesting thing. It's certainly the case in the U.S. where we have huge discrepancies in wealth between districts that if you look at the practices going on in classrooms, much more controlling practices are going on in the poor districts. But the reason for that is because they're under much greater outcome-focused pressure. So they have to do more teaching to the test. And what's really sad to me in that is the very students who are having trouble getting engaged in the first place, then we introduce to them a very disengaging curriculum. And, uh, and so, yeah, there's, a, there's an SES effect, but it tends to be uh, in part confounded by some of the pressures that are on those school districts around, uh, around that result in those different teaching styles. Uh, but I will say this, which is uh, no school is immune from these kinds of pressures. You can have very high SES uh, schools where every parent in it and uh, all the teachers in it are all focused on how they're doing next to the other school down uh, three miles away and whether their test scores are you know a, a 18th of a standard deviation away from theirs because people don't know how to interpret numbers they look at that they will say oh that's a better school than this one because it's got a higher score on X and that puts pressure on that school to then be controlling with respect to um, its outcome so we, we see it in uh, all levels of schooling and um, you know this the variation remains the same so it's not moderated by SES the, the effect is the same are there any whole school studies that sort of look at schools that would you say bucking that trend in lower CS communities? Have you? Yes. Yeah. And there are a number of uh, whole school studies that are out there in the literature now. I just re read one today where they were looking at a school that had made a transformation toward a more student-centered uh, uh, classroom uh, style. Uh, they did find increased need satisfaction in the students and in the teachers, really interestingly. And uh, the school performance outcomes were better for that. So there's been a number of these kinds of experiments. I've been involved in some myself on a very practical level. They're not easy, getting back to the not easy thing. Uh, taking the jump away from a high controlling structure to a more autonomy supportive structure is, uh, is something that uh, you can't do like in an instant because one thing that happens if you've been a really high, highly controlling school and you suddenly lift the controls, all oh, hell breaks loose because of the self-fulfilling prophecy which is the way I've been motivated is watching out for your controls. If you just remove those that's a problem. So at least in the schools where I've been involved in that kind of transformation, we've had to kind of uh, do a graded uh, structural release uh, so people well, can I learn. I think that the yeah. schools would uh, perhaps um, not understand the importance of structure to, right. to be maintained in some, some structure being yeah. maintained to, from what you were yeah. showing. I do have one, one quick story to tell you though about a school that had a complete absence of structure, a ton of freedom. Um, it was, I don't know if any of you here have known about Summerhill Schools, uh, A.S. Neal, an old experiment. Well, there was a school in Boston that was operating on the Summerhill idea, and they had an open school where they didn't require reading or math or anything in the students. They let them do whatever they wanted to do, basically, uh, for 12 years. Uh, now, it turns out that, you know, most students, after they sit around for a few years not reading and they're seeing other kids read, they want to read. They, they learn to read. Uh, they pick it up, they pick up those skills. So by the time most kids gradua graduated from this high school, they were college eligible. Many of them went on to colleges, et cetera. So somebody came to uh, our uh, group at the University of Rochester to do a report on the 30-year follow-up from what happened to students who were in the school. And when they came to give us the report, they, the person who gave us the report was doing it in a kind of damning way. I think they wanted to tell us that we were wrong. And uh, so when she was presenting the data, she showed that students who had graduated from this school had no, they were not making any more money than comparable SES students who went to the other schools. They were not doing more, they weren't more satisfied with their current jobs. Uh, they were equal to the students who had been through the regular uh, school system. And she was saying, see, I, you know, we knew it didn't work. And I was like, so you mean to all that lining the kids up in the hall, all those tests, all that homework didn't show any advantages 30 years later? So, I mean, I just, one of the things about this, we, we think all the structure is doing so much for us. And I think, you know, most of us can think back on some of the stuff that was really hard pressured into us now. And I can't even tell you the classes I took, let alone the content of a lot of that stuff. It didn't matter later in life. What matters is if you do a pickup, what will matter a lot more to our students, and certainly what I wanted from my children is not that they knew every nuance of trigonometry or calculus when they left school, but rather they left school with a kind of confidence, a kind of desire to learn, 
a belief in themselves, a passion for wanting to know more about anything. That's the kind of stuff I'd like kids to leave school with. Uh, a lot of inner city kids who were trying to get into college prep level outcomes before they leave school, I'd be glad that they attended school for 12 years and found something passionate and interesting to engage during that time, because that would be a better predictor of them succeeding in life thereafter than a higher test score. I think we've got the wrong idea about what education's really about, and it's about nurturing people to grow up to be good citizens with the kind of skills, interests, and passions that allow us to be those things. And if we drive that out of students through our educational techniques, we're doing a disservice to all of them. So I, I do believe in high structure, and I do believe in high autonomy support. So I think those are the most effective things. And I actually believe that we do have a curriculum that has a rationale sometimes. Not all of it, but some of it does. Uh, I think we could lean a lot less on curriculum, get a lot less focused on content, a lot more focused on process, and we would have better schools. Have you ever seen that episode of The Wire where it's about, you know, a, uh, an underprivileged Baltimore school where they want to get good results on the SAT so that that will improve funding? Yep. And so they reduce the curriculum down, mm -hmm. and because that has a consequent effect on behavior, they turn the heat right up yeah. in winter, so the kids are sort of docile. <laughs> it's fabulous. <laughs> you just can see it. I wanted to send it to the <laughs> when they were proposing the uh, yes, all of the tests and the the website. You can go and check out how well your school's doing against some of this. Yeah. Well, you know, to me, to me, if we were putting as much emphasis on measures of classroom climate as we were putting emphasis on test score outcomes, we'd be at least putting the pressure in the right place. Uh, but instead, we're putting the pressure on the wrong node, leads to more controlling behavior, and then has a backfiring effect. So, well, oh, I'll take the yeah. uh, thing about where you get buy-in. Um, the positive psychology and positive education movement has been pretty successful, but probably more so in private schools than in public schools. <laughs> There, are there, is there a sort of parallel movement going on in this area? But, first, uh, first of all, I mean, you point out a great irony here, which is private schools, and, and, and here, I, of course, you know, I get a little confused with the terminology down here, but private schools where people have a choice about sending their kids, where the schools aren't so uh, constrained by the government regulations and other things, actually choose not to do the high-stakes test route. They choose to do less of the emphasis on this. Why do they do that? because they know it's better educational practice. And that's why we would want to send our kids to those schools. There's a paradox of, in order to improve public schooling, we'll do all the things that we know that the good private schools aren't doing. Why would we do that? And, and you know, in the, in the US, private schools are not subjected to the high stakes testing regimen of the rest of the country. And the wealthiest people in the country send their kids to those schools while we insist that the poor kids get the high stakes testing. It's a remarkable irony to me that there's something in that where we already do know about good practice and we know that the latter is not uh, good practice. What was your question? Well, I was just thinking, <laughs> <laughs> you commented that there's enough intervention studies. Yes. And most yeah. sort of naturalistic studies to yeah. see what happens. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, are, are there any demonstration units that are set up where people don't just check to see what's related to what, but actually uh, put their money in, they actually back a particular approach, you know, to, to, to sort of run parallel streams or whatever, just, just to really check. Well, as, as I've said, there's been a few randomized controlled trials uh, putting SDT techniques into practice uh, in teacher training and looking at the outcomes relative to other schools. There's also been big school reform studies that have been done. So I was just involved in one uh, in the U.S. where we had 20 large high schools across the country that were part of a randomized controlled trial uh, showing that when you had more uh, engaging classroom practice, you got better even test score outcomes uh, from that. So there's, there's plenty of evidence out there. It's about whether we have the political will to follow the evidence, I think, more than uh, the other. Because I, I guess, again, I would just go back to policy. What's shaping policy is not the evidence base of educators. It's the money that's coming from publishing companies. It's the money that's coming from test makers. It's a lot of other people who are having influence that's not based on evidence. 
Well, I'm going to stop there. I'll be around for other questions. I do want to remind one thing here, though, which is while well, it comes back to the other Ryan who was here in the room. So maybe, Ryan, you want to uh, say something. But anyway, before Ryan speaks, I'll just say thank you very much for your uh, patience tonight. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, again, if you have any questions about IT2 project that I talked about in the beginning, more than happy to talk about that. Um, but otherwise, I'll let you get on with the rest of your evening. And thank you very much for coming. IT is free. It's awesome. <laughs> <la